What if I were to tell you that more breaches are done by stolen credentials than any other tactic? What if I were to tell you that Microsoft thinks that they could thwart 99% of these attacks by just doing one simple thing? Well, that one simple thing, it's multi-factor authentication. You know you should be using it. You might be for some things, but are you using it everywhere possible? So let's talk about it. Hi, I'm Chris Burtz from Techie Gurus and welcome back. So we've already talked about World Password Day, how to construct a good password. We've talked about passwordless, where you can log in without even having a password or knowing what a password is. We've talked about single sign-on, where you can use one identity to log into multiple places and you can combine passwordless with single sign-on, but it's not quite there yet. Not ready for prime time. For some things, sure, but not for everything. So where do we go from there? Multi-factor authentication. So when you have a password, you have another factor to identify you. That's how we thwart a lot of these attacks. And the other factor can be something you know, something you have, or something that you are. We typically go with something that you have or something that you are. So biometrics would be something that you that you are. And a token, it could have been a little RSA token back in the day, or for most people it's a phone now with an application on it something that you have. So we combine that with your password and you're going to throw it up to 99% of attacks according to Microsoft. Now there are ways around it, but those are some sophisticated attacks. Passwords are just very dangerous because passwords are so easy to attack between people not having well, long enough passwords or complex passwords to phishing emails where people actually put their credentials in. Well, guess what? If you have MFA, multi-factor authentication, for the most part, if you get phished, if some a user does put their credentials into a phishing website, they still don't have the other factor. See, that's why it stops most attacks. Now, there again, there are ways to get around multi-factor authentication, but those are very sophisticated attacks. Not typically what you're going to see from just a basic phishing email. So actually, let's talk about how multi-factor authentication works. So if you check up here, or here, depends on where I put it in the video, you're gonna see how an access request works. First, the first factor is going to be submitted. Most of the time, that's your password. Now, there are, there are some applications that will ask for your MFA first, but those are a little odd. For the most part, it's gonna ask for your password. So you put your username in, your password in, it's gonna, it's gonna go, okay, is the context correct? If it's not, it's gonna deny it immediately. If the, if the context is, is correct, it's going to say, okay, now we need to have your second factor of authentication, which normally will be push something on your phone, like for allow, or it might be getting the code from your phone and putting it in. And then once that is done, it's going to say, okay, is that factor proper? Is that factor correct? And if it is, it's going to go, cool, you're approved to log in, congratulations. If not, it's going to fail it. That's how you combat phishing when somebody has your credentials, but they don't have the second factor. So let's kind of talk about how we can implement this in our business and like where it's really important. So let's talk about a couple ways where multi-factor authentication makes sense. One, your bank, right? You log into your bank account. You should have some sort of factor that needs to be done. I know a lot of banks still use text messaging. Don't love that. Wish it was an application or wish it was some sort of uh, other way of doing it, but that's where it uh, exists today. Now, it should also prompt you when you're going to do a transaction. So let's say you're going to transfer money. Definitely should require that level of authentication to be done again. So just in case you left a browser logged in, somebody walked up to your computer, they can't just transfer money away from it. Now I know a lot of banks log out in a short period of time, but there's still that time where if you walked away, somebody could actually access your account. And if they didn't require a second factor for like transfer money, they could just go and transfer money and it'd be gone. So another way to do this would be, let's say you have an HR application or something else, and you just want to make sure that the employee is who the employee is. This could even be a payroll situation. You're going to require that they have multi-factor authentication on that account so that they can't maybe change their direct deposit, which we've seen with a customer who had money stolen because they didn't have uh, multi-factor authentication or MFA turned on on their payroll system, and somebody got their credentials harvested and they logged in they changed your bank account twice 
place. Yeah, the first one was stopped, the second one wasn't. And another one, probably the most important one we should talk about is email. Email is the lifeblood of a lot of businesses. We need to be protecting email with multi-factor authentication, MFA. You need to do it. Now, you don't have to do it. I guess I'm, I'm telling you to do it, but you don't really have to do it. You know, I mean, you can just get, you know, impersonated, embarrassed. People send out m massive spam campaigns from your email. I mean, if that's what you want, then, then, then don't do it. But if you want to stop that or at least minimize the chance of that happening, you should probably turn it on for your business. You know, just in case. So those are three examples of where multi-factor authentication makes sense. So let's talk about the ways that you can do it. All right, I touched a little bit on how to do MFA. You could use SMS or text messages, which we don't love. You can use apps on your phone. These are all cloud-based. So you don't have to have anything on, on premise. You don't have to buy a bunch of equipment. You don't have to buy cards. You don't have to buy tokens or anything like that. However, there is something called FIDO2 and it's part of passwordless, but it's also part of multi-factor authentication, and that's where you would have a security key. Um, there's a few popular ones out there, like a specific one for me to be YubiKey, and you can use a hardware key that you have to have plugged in to even log in. So if, it's, if you don't have it or if you lose it, you wouldn't be able to log in. So that's an example of something that you, you know, have with you. Some of them also have built-in MFA that you're going to use on top of that. So it's actually, it really is multi-factor, not just two-factor authentication. So those are the ways that you can do it. We don't you really use a hardware key, but there are certain situations where a hardware key might make sense. A bank transfer might be one that you'd want to think about having something like that. Um, if you deal with really sensitive stuff, maybe government stuff, might be an idea that you might want to think about doing hardware keys. But it's also if somebody loses a hardware key, it becomes a little bit more of a, an issue. So you really need to have almost two hardware keys that somebody has associated with them or have a very easy way of, of issuing another one and resetting that. So a lot of times we get a question, how hard is this to implement? Because my users, they really, they're really not that computer savvy. Which, believe it or not, I hear that a lot. A lot more than I really should. The reality is, is Multi-factor authentication is super easy. It's even customizable. I mean, if your user or worker is going to be on site most of the time, we can do things like something called conditional access where maybe we're not prompting them for MFA because we know that they have to be at this location to log in. And if they're not at that location, that's when it would prompt them. See, not every application supports that, but specifically Microsoft supports that. And that's something that we do every day because there are people that work on a floor that you want to protect the account, but maybe they don't have a way of sharing that MFA. Maybe that's a shared user experience. So there are ways to do that. But honestly, it's super easy. You just have an app on your phone. Almost everybody has a smartphone today. And if they don't, there are ways to do it where the person can get a phone call with the code. They still get a text message. We don't love that. But we also understand that that's something, sometimes that's just the situation that you're in and that's the situation you have to go with. It's still better than nothing. So it's, it's really easy. And we can do a demonstration and maybe one day I'll do a video on demonstration. But, you know, you could use something like Duo. You could use something like built-in Microsoft MFA. Duo is going to cost you money. Microsoft actually gives you free MFA for your 365. It's super easy to use. The one downside I would say to the Microsoft one is if you do uh, push authentication, and this is this is not just a Microsoft problem, this is a, a problem in general. If you push to a user to say, hey, is this you? And the person just hits allow, well, that's great if they're logging in, but what's not great, it's called MFA bashing, and this is a newer way of doing it, the attacker will know the password, and they're gonna, they're gonna know the password is successful because they're gonna get prompted for MFA. So they're just going to keep submitting and submitting and submitting. And so what's going to happen is somebody's going to look at their phone and they're going to be like, okay, a lot, they're going to think it's just some device asking to re-authenticate and they're going to hit allow. That's where a bypass for MFA can come in because now they've just allowed that device that the hacker was using to get in and now they have a cookie and now they're going to have a session time where they can do whatever they want. So 
There are downsides to MFA. Like I said, it stops 99% of the attacks according to Microsoft. Uh, Google has the same statistics, but there is a downside to it. If users aren't trained and they're, they just do something like hit allow when they didn't know if it was them or not. But that's a that's something that we can combat against. We can we can teach users. We can educate users on when to do it, when not to do it. Another way, if we ever move to passwordless, which is going to require a form of multi-factor authentication, is they're going to have a code they're going to have to type in on their phone that they're going to see on the website. So even, even if somebody does try to bash them, like they're going to have to type the code in, but they don't see the code unless they're trying to log into the site. So... They don't see the, if they don't see that, it's not going to work. So this is multi-factor authentication in a nutshell. Those are some of the downsides and some of the benefits of it. And it's, it's up to you to decide whether it's good for your business. So I want to wrap this month up. I know next, next week is Memorial Week, and it's something that we'll have a video on Tuesday, but it'll probably be more for June. Um, I just want to say, hey, thank you for hanging in with us. Thank you for commenting on the videos if you commented. We want to hear more from you. Please comment, ask questions. We're here. We're here to help. We're here to spread our message, our, our education to you. I want to make sure that every business is safe. We want to protect a million people. And we can't do that without you watching our videos, without you helping us. So, hope you have a safe Memorial Weekend coming up here. And until next time, stay cyber safe.